So what I want to do um, over the next 45 minutes or so is take you through this decade of uh, what I describe as the two revolutions, the digital and the biological. Uh, go through year by year what I think has been important, what I think has been shaping this uh, notion or this emergence of the post-human. And in terms of a thesis, my argument is that we are becoming post-human, that in fact we can look at different aspects of our technological culture and see intimations of this. The claim, however, is not uh, an evolutionary claim, uh, but it's, it's, it's a claim about the role of technological culture in determining our uh, existence. And I think that intersection, the degree to which uh, technology has transformed us sociologically, um, is actually more significant than the evolutionary claim. So back in 98, 99, this period where, the inter uh, where genetic technology was beginning to gain widespread attention, my focus was on sports. I was looking at how technology was changing these environments and attended the first International Congress on Human Rights in Sport in Sydney and wrote about genetic technology. What it seemed to me and what remains central to my own explorations of, of all the work that I do is the degree to which um, social justice was at stake in the development of this technology. So whilst we might have had um, instruments like the UNESCO Declaration on Human Rights for many years, how did these instruments actually fare when faced with a, a potentially new kind of person, someone who is genetically different from uh, what is typically expected of a person? Would this protect us adequately? Would we need new instruments to protect our rights? Uh, how could someone that's genetically modified fit into a cultural practice like sport? Would they have a place? Uh, would um, disability acts enable them to have a place in sport? Or could these enterprises, which are predominantly privately funded, effectively discard the genetically modified from the practice and say, you can't play here, go somewhere else? So very quickly, it was apparent that the questions at stake were about justice and about entitlement to uh, participate in public life and social life. Uh, about the same time, I became uh, involved with uh, not that intimately, I might hasten to add, the Olympic movement. I got uh, an education from a place called the International Olympic Academy in Greece and uh, very quickly learnt about this notion, which was fascinating. The idea that there's a movement here, and it describes itself as a movement that somehow ha has some broader currency uh, that relates to humanitarian aspirations, that they fund a lot of work to enable participation in sport around the world. Um, but also to see how divisive this organization was, which described itself as an international non-governmental organization, but which, of course, was underpinned by significant corporate contracts uh, that, that one would argue restrict that ability to deliver on, on what it claims to be a movement. So the Olympic Games and my education in the Olympic Games became part and parcel of this work in, in a very um, ad hoc way. Uh, about the same year, in fact, uh, the same year I got to know the Olympic, British Olympic Association, I also became interested in cryonics. For those of you that don't know, cryogenics is a study of, uh, of, of uh, well, cryonics in this case is the way in which we might preserve ourselves later on. So you can see here an article from one of the tabloids uh, that describes these people as the immortals. And I met a bunch of them in Eastbourne in 1999, of all places. And so... Um, so p people were thinking about the prospect of life extension at this point. Could we envisage making ourselves live for longer? And to some degree, we've already done that through medical science. We're living longer than we, are, than we have in the past. Uh, how far could we take that? So some of the questions that seemed important here was really how far was the science prepared to go uh, for the ben benefit of humanity, which, of course, might not be for the benefit of our ecosystem. But nevertheless, this was taking place. There were people out there that have signed up to this paid their money, um, and in case, if you're, if you're interested in, in, in you know, potentially being reanimated after you cease to exist, there are two options you can go for. One's a brain-only option, or the other's a full body. So if you're feeling a bit thrifty, then go for the brain-only brain option, which is about 80,000 US. Um, full body is about 150,000. So I turned up at Eastbourne uh, on a sort of cold autumn day, and it was an industrial estate. Um, I was there early, I usually am, so I got there, sat in the car, waited there for about half an hour, and after that time, three cars turned up. One was a Ferrari, another was a Porsche, and the other was a Rolls-Royce in this really 
quite grim environment. Everything corrugated iron around us. They got out of the car. Jack, the person that I'd been in touch with, met me, and he said, nice to meet you. And they were all about 75 years old. So, you know, one might argue that, in fact, I just thought they, most of them probably aren't living anymore. I wonder, if they, <laughs> I wonder if they went through with it. But they had someone over from the USA, um, from Alcor. If you're interested at all, there's an Alcor UK. This is the organization that does this here. And they'd invited some experts over from the US who uh, were going to run them through the procedure so that, you know, the big thing is to um, make sure they get to you soon enough because as soon as you drop dead, um, you start to decompose very quickly. So if there's much time between them and uh, between you kicking the bucket and them being able to get to you, um, then you might not be able to be brought back in any potential future because your brain will be jelly by that point. So they need to get you to get to you very quickly. You need to get you certified as, as clinically dead and uh, then ship you off to the corrugated iron uh, surgery. Now, they didn't seem off the wall, and I've met some off the wall people, um, and they seemed quite reasonably convinced by the idea that we've got two options. We either cease to exist, or we buy into a system that might, in some remotest possibility, bring us back at some later date. Uh, and that's what they chose. They chose to go for that option. They had the money to do it, um, so why not? And, um, and so they were called the immortalists by, by, the, uh, by the press. And this was seen as something that was very much out of left field, something that we wouldn't want to do. Although I read recently some people are also stuffing themselves after they die. So, you know, there are a number of practices that might be described as, as crazy. At least you've got a chance of coming back with this one. Um, so this again became instrumental in my thoughts. How far could science go in, in taking us uh, into the realm of speculative ethics? W would this be reasonable to pursue, or is it just simply a waste of our time? And, but, and of course, these are relevant questions when thinking about research. At the same time, discussions about the internet were beginning to imagine these prospects, as uh, uh, Donna Haraway, one of the writers, wrote about in her manifesto for cyborgs. We were beginning to see a a vision of the future that talked about a number of utopian ideas, ideas that, are, that were about us leaving our bodies behind, no longer being burdened by uh, physical world environments and, and being liberated as a result of those. Um, at stake in all this, and I think this is, again, what intrigued me about it, was the way in which uh, these propositions were artic articulated via a number of aesthetic notions. And I want to uh, present one film to you here uh, which suggests that, so if we can cue the music. So as you can see from this clip which came out just this year, what was at stake here was, I think, a, a tension between different visions of the future, ones that people felt were intriguing, the prospect of, of, of exploring our morphological th freedom, as, as some people have put it, and those that felt that ultimately that pursuit uh, was something that would be restricted by corporate influences, normative associations of, of what beauty should entail. Uh, and it seemed to me that there was, there was some middle ground between the two. Uh, that, in fact, we need not be subject to these sorts of uh, expectations to live up to a certain notion of ideal, of beauty. And I'll go on to talk a bit more about that. 